Welcome to Raging Bullets, a DC Comics fan podcast, episode 275. Welcome to Raging Bullets, I'm Sean Lillian, Dr. Norge on the Comic Forums, and I'm joined as always by my co-host Jim, the sensei of the whatnot, Segulin, and the Duke of You Know. Well, a funny thing happened. Jim and I started recording tonight. Um, we, we'd been delayed over the weekend with some technical issues on our end. And we started recording tonight with the intention of recording an episode containing the rest of League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, which is what you're getting right now, and listener voicemails, and we started recording some of the new 52 books. Well, by the time we were done, we had a five and a half hour episode, which is just way too long. So what I'm going to do is I'm releasing right now, uncut and unedited, just to give you some content tonight, the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen conversation that we just had, containing issues four through six. It's about an hour and a half, so to give you a shorter episode, we're going to come back in a few days, right before the weekend hits, uh, probably on Friday night, with the 52 discussion that we had. From here on out, we're going to be doing all episodes focusing on the new 52 until we've covered all of the new 52 books. So um, a lot of our books will be covering um, issue ones and issue twos as they're released until we've covered every single book for you. So I want to thank you for your patience on that and really hope you enjoy this episode. We are proud members of the Comics Podcast Network and the League of Comic Book Podcasts. Sponsoring us this episode is DCBService.com and InStockTrades.com. Remember, DCBService.com, if you haven't had a chance to grab it, your last few days to be getting issue number three at 50% off if you do that bundle deal. So it's a great chance for those of you that have been like pre-ordering all the issues of the new 52. Great chance to get those 52 issues in that bundle at 50% off a piece. So go do that through DCBService.com. Remember, if you're buying your digital comics, make sure to do it through the DCB service portal right on there. And the great part is not only can you use that portal to buy your comics, you can use that portal to read your comics as well. So it's a comicsology portal right from our show sponsor, DCB service. And the great part is any of the comics that you buy there, it's the same price that you'd buy straight from comicsology through any apps or things like that. The comics are accessible because you're accessing your account through any of the apps on any computer, anything where you have a comicsology app that you've downloaded. So it's a great chance for you to buy your DC books that way, but also any of the digital offerings and it helps out our show sponsor, dcbservice.com. So please be sure to do that. InStockTrades.com, be sure to check them out for your trades and hardcover needs. They have all wonderful collected editions at amazing discounts, plus orders of $50 or more give you free shipping. So thank you, DCB Service and InStockTrades.com for supporting the show. James, what kind of a podcast are we? Raging Bullets is a spoiler podcast. We go in-depth into plot lines, story twists, and whatnot of the comics we're discussing on the show. So, if you haven't read the books, you may want to come back later so you can better enjoy the show. Nice work, Adam. What are these characters up to? Jim, I, I really want to talk about uh, the final three issues of League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, Volume 1. It was really interesting for me because, I, as I mentioned on the last time we discussed this on episode 270, this was something that I read when it came out back in the day. I hadn't read it again in ages. And, and to revisit this with these characters now, one of the things that really struck me this time through, especially as we're like at the halfway point of the series, was this sense of these characters against overwhelming odds, these characters all having vulnerabilities, and wondering how they were going to overcome everything that was being put against them. I liked that throughout this whole thing, a lot of times they had to take advantage of luck, you know, going their way, if that makes sense, events around them opening up opportunities, versus it being strictly that, wow, they were this, this superior group of people that were put together. They were all remarkable in their own way, and there was something unique and interesting about each character, but there was this sense of humanity to them, which is funny considering they're all these literary legends <laughs> put together in the book. But I found that something really neat and refreshing about this was the fact that they kept their same humanity and their same vulnerabilities from the original work that they were a part of. And that was, it struck me this time. I don't know. Um, what was your experience like um, with this series? Because I know you've read it again since you and I have chatted last time about it. 
Well, one of the things with that I really liked about this was the realism of it. Now, it's funny whenever you, we talk comic books or we talk stories like this because there's some seriously far-fetched stuff going on, you know, just the Nemo's technology and Jekyll and Hyde and all of that. And in that same breath, I'm saying realistic because these characters have these personalities. They have these normal human uh, qualities, these traits, their strengths, their weaknesses. Seeing Quartermain in the first section where he's trying to, you know, shake the drugs, and then even later on we're going to see some great, you know, just human emotion from him. It's stuff like that that keeps the story interesting, keeps it fun, but it gives you that connection to him so that as this is going on, you're thinking, hey, this person could die very easily. This, there's nothing set in stone as to that all these people have to live because we've already pulled them out of their regular story universe, so anything can happen. And I love having that feeling that not knowing what's going to happen next. And you know, then when you see it, you're like, oh, cool. One of the things I love that was clever in this, because when, when issue four opens up, you get to see some time spent with Nemo and his crew, getting to see that this is a captain who does take the council of his crew members. Now, as we know about Nemo, Nemo is going to do what Nemo wants to do. Um, anybody who's been seen any version or read any version of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea knows that Nemo will go do his thing, which we see a lot of in this series as well. But he does listen. He does value the advice. Uh, and like any true captain, he will decide what to take it. But I love that one of the people on there is Ishmael from yeah. Moby Dick. You know, the wandering sailor from that. And that's one of the things that I thought was really great that from... Right around the same eras, Moore tried to find ways to fit in characters that would naturally wind up being in these possible places post the events of their stories. And that was something that really struck me about the whole thing. One of the things I digged about that, one, I did chuckle with the Call Me Ishmael line just because you know, that was a great usage of it. But also, in Moby Dick, which occurred before this would happen, he was a younger man. So yes. here we're seeing a little bit older version of Ishmael, and I thought that was a great attention to detail. Yes, which was something that I really enjoyed as well, seeing like where the characters go afterwards. Because I was I read Moby Dick, so it was it was great to kind of see the sequel, quote unquote, of sorts to what happened to Ishmael after that. When we see um, Mina Harker and uh, Qu Quartermain climbing down, I <laughs> talk about some great artistic visual moments because you know we I didn't occur to me that in this series. We never discover Mina's secret. Yeah. Like, her neck's constantly covered up, but the things that were revealed in the movie about her were not revealed in this. So she, she remained, like, quote-unquote human. I, I think when we see her with Hyde, which we'll talk about later, we get to finally start seeing some of that come forward, what's going actually going on with her. But I, I love the visual bit with Quartermain, where she's telling him not to look up, but, of course, what are you going to do when you're yeah. climbing down a ladder and, and a woman's telling you not to look up? You're going to look up. It's, one of, it's a psychological thing. Like, you can't help it. It's, she was better served by not saying anything <laughs> than having that happen with him. It's that whole um, don't look now, and then you quickly turn and look and see. But you're talking just art moments. One, just the, the sequence when they're climbing down, you see the background stuff. But also that look when he does look up, that kind of look of, you know, that shock. That's what that I was meant. On his that, face was just wonderful. Absolutely. That's what I meant by the art. I love, uh, we've talked about on the show, uh, not just facial expressions, but personality coming through in the characters. How each character visually, uh, just beyond just the face, has a personality and a tone to them. And you can kind of see them from every angle as who they are and the way they carry themselves. Um, it can be from the way that they actually move and they're drawn as far as having that sense of motion to um, emotional moments like that one with him, which was great. I also loved, in that same page, the sense of fear. We already saw what he went through with Fu Manchu. Mm -hmm. And for him to be thrust into that sequence now with Mina, who, you know, they're, they're both kind of in denial that there's some kind of attraction between the two of them going on there. And I love that we as readers, I think it really pays to see this sequence having read it before, to know that there was something going on between the two of them, but they didn't know it. And to see visually that, that those clues were there. Mm -hmm. all along but i didn't notice it as much through the first read through 
as I did in later read-throughs when we've done it for the show this time around. So it does read differently. And I'm, I'm a fan of that, going back and saying, oh, my gosh, it was there all along. The two of them, you know, had this kind of thing going on between the two of them, you know, from her denials about him looking up to his reaction to him protecting her in that moment, you know, with uh, don't let him see you. Because he, he could have just, like, basically cowered back himself and ran away <laughs> I mean, if that was, he was really scared at that moment. Uh, but instead, you know, we see a guy who is being chivalrous, even though he's scared, he's, he's showing some chivalry in and protecting her. And I just, I really dug that. The Fu Manchu sequence was something, you know, we're seeing beheadings and things like that and beatings with these um, bamboo sticks. Um, those sequences were something that uh, were important to me because we needed to see his power because we need to believe later that he is a force that the opposition, well, let's just say Moriarty, is going to want to face. Uh, Because we're going to be talking about that later, so we might as well just throw out there that it's Moriarty that we're dealing with here. So it isn't just about getting this cover right. Um, This is somebody who Moriarty sees as being an imposing force, an army that he has to take down if he really wants to take control of the underworld. And, And that's a really important like side story backstory here that i think you catch a lot more in the second read through that it isn't just about getting the cover right from fu manchu and feeling like he's a threat that way it's feeling like he's a larger threat to moriarty oh definitely and it was you know when you're talking about just the artwork again not only showing quartermain just you know being that chivalrous hero that we know he is you know where he's protecting me i love seeing the chaos of those workers as they're scrambling. And you mentioned how when the one didn't bow fast enough, head gone, you know, and it shows viciousness of Fu Manchu, but it just, it was this wonderful usage, you know, I always talk about like in battle sequences, I like seeing the chaos of the, of, you know, the fight in the actual artwork and it gets me going. This was another one of those chaotic moments. And we talked earlier about realism, Quartermain's legitimate fear of this really nasty dude is one of the things that re- just had me completely latched onto, onto not only the character but on what you know the story they're telling, and it was just a really um, I don't moving in in a way as a moving, but it was also just that connection point. You know, you start looking at these characters not as characters, but as people you know, as your friends, as maybe Quartermain's you know a mentor, an old mentor of mine who you know I want to help out in the Great Hunt. You know, it's just you can start you know gaining a personal uh, relationship with them, and that's something that was really I was really glad I got from just you know four issues. I'm already having this connection with this guy. That is something that's in my favorite comics. That's what I like. It's that sense of disbelief, that sense of motion, that sense of reality, that sense of three-dimensional, that these characters are popping off the page and they're living full lives. And it isn't just flat, you know, a flat paper page. It's, it is more than that. Uh, you know, and that's, I think that's where great fiction it brings you into the story and captivates you. When, when you start believing that there's things happening that you don't see visually. You know, they, they set up just enough to get the imagination flowing. You start filling in the blanks. You put the, the reel to the film. <laughs> you know, you start, it's, it starts, I can almost hear the clacking of it as it's going along and seeing these characters moving, which is something I like. Quartermain pulling out the gun. Yeah. And you, I would be the same way. That's one of the things I loved about him and his humanity is the sense that I, I do believe he's this great explorer. I do believe he's somebody I'd look up to if I was with him, even with the fact that he was down and out on his luck. He's somebody I'd look at his adventures, you know, because I got a, my friend, Kurt, a very good friend of mine who travels a lot. He's gone to all these wonderful, amazing places. Um, some of them I'm very interested in going to. Some of them I'm not as interested in going into because he's a diver. I'm not. So for him, that's his thing. But Every, in every instance that I'm d- talking about, I can appreciate his passion for them, and I can really appreciate when he brings back pictures of them, what it looks like, you know, in those places, um, you know, I, the, seeing the exotic. Quartermain's all about the exotic, and mm-hmm. um, you know, I connected with him like I would my friend Kurt, where you know we we don't have a, necessarily all the same interests, Quartermain and I, but. Um, I can respect everything that he's done and everything that he's accomplished and the fact that he is human and he's made mistakes along the way in that journey, but that this is the guy, if you're going into one of these types of situations, he's going to bring something different to the table. He's got a skill set that he's incredibly good at 
And that skill set's going to give you a little bit of an edge. When he pulls out the gun, I would do the same thing. Um, you know, granted, you've only got one shot with that elephant gun, as Mina's quick to point out to him, but it's not about shooting the gun. It's about the deterrent of maybe that'll buy you a few seconds. And that in this book has been all about crucial few seconds. Uh, a distraction here, a distraction there, a bl- an explosion here, an explosion there. These little tiny things that happen around them for this band of misfits has been the edge that they've needed to survive a situation to, you know, it's, it's funny, they win in this, but it's not a victory in the sense where it's, you know, it's a definitive, strong victory. It's, sometimes your victory is survival. And for them, that really is their victory in all of this, is surviving everything that's going on around them and in some ways being a catalyst of things not going well for the villains, you know, versus uh, like we've locked up the villain, put them behind bars, which we're used to seeing in a lot of comic book stories. It's not that clean. It's not that cut and dry. And I like that it's not clean. There's, a, you know, it's a little bit of a dirty ending. Uh, you, you feel like you want to high five everybody at the end for walking away with, from it all. But I like that it doesn't feel like that it's something different, you know, and that's not a knock. I love clean superhero stories where they, you know, end clean with a firm victory. But sometimes I like the ones that, you know, end in a way that's a little bit different where you're just kind of like, well, well that was, was that a victory? Well, maybe <laughs> the victory was in just being here to talk about it. <laughs> the league is kind of a government uh, black ops team. So uh-huh. when you get sometimes with those type of missions, Things aren't always clean. Sometimes it's got to get a little dirty. It's got to get a little bit, uh, you know, off of what you would expect for the quote unquote heroes. And that was something that I really enjoyed seeing out of this. If this, you know, if it, if this had been like the clean cut, you know, you know, happy ending, I, I don't think I would. It wouldn't have been. It wouldn't have had that same believability that it's always had. And that was something I was really kind of happy to see how this played out. And it's something that got me excited to read more of the, you know, the volumes and actually continue following the story and see where these characters go because I like that. I, I it's again, it's a different take on you know the stories that i'm reading it's a little bit different you know and i you can't eat, read the same thing over and over again you got to have a little spice and this is definitely uh some spice for me and i'm enjoying it one of the things that i really liked about um this book was the evolution of the characters along the way when the story started off mina harker was clearly the squad leader uh, she was pulling together uh, a band, like a band of misfits like i mentioned and these people were trying to find their role in life their role as a team uh, you know, even if they even wanted to be a part of all this, as they got more comfortable together, as circumstances thrust them together and they realized they needed to rely on each other and that they were stronger together, you start to see confidence growing. First, Nemo, obviously, it's going to be there because he's Captain Nemo. Um, and that's something he never lost um, when he started seeing where he could start taking advantage of what he brought to the table. We see him taking on more of a leadership role, but also Quartermain. As the series went on, you really start to see Quartermain taking on a more aggressive role, not to the point where he's pushy or anything like that, but where he's willing to stick to his guns. He's willing to bring his two cents worth in. You see his morality. When it comes to Griffin, Griffin walks up and slits the throat of that guard who is standing there, and it was really a situation where Quartermain firing his gun there would have been the wrong move and probably would have ended things. Um, They would have been discovered. Uh, you know, the, the covert black ops you were talking about, Jim, would not be a very covert yeah. black ops. Uh, you know, who knows how that would have ended for all of them. But he provided the opportunity for them to get outfits and to be able to sneak in. And I, I liked how that all turned out. And the Griffin, at no point in time do I feel Griffin's a hero. Uh, Griffin very much is an opportunist. He sees that this situation is an opportunity for him to kind of get his own life back and you know have his own role and i love that very similar to the discussion that was going on in the beginning about bond campion bond and that things didn't feel right when uh, nemo was talking to his crew we see that griffin is starting to get very suspicious of the things going on around him which being a guy who is invisible and tends to see a lot of things behind closed doors that none of the other members of this uh, crew would have seen It makes sense that he would be the guy that'd say, hey, wait a minute, something doesn't feel right here. I've seen this so many times before where, you know, on a surface, this looks like what's going on, but then behind closed doors, you know, he knows what people say behind other people's backs. Yeah. 
you know, that people have secrets, things they don't want discovered and all that. So he would have probably one of the more experienced radars. I also love seeing his handprint all over the place, the bloody handprint. After um, they slit the guy's throat, you know, we see it by the machete. But then we also see it on the next page, like on the doors that he's opening, on the side of door panels. You know, it's that same handprint popping up in different places. Very faint, but it's enough. You know, we see it up until he gets up to Jekyll. <laughs> and, and I loved that whole just visual play out of the whole thing with oh, Griffin. Definitely. Griffin was a character who really captivated me in this, this read through. And I don't know why before he was kind of a background character for me. And he stood out for me more in this one. I think just because I think you can read this series and shift your focus. I don't know if you did that. Were there characters you focused on differently each time you read, or was it the same experience? How did it, I don't know if there's a right or wrong way to read this, but what did you do? Oh, definitely. There was always uh, every time you read something, you're going to have a little bit difference. And it was funny that scene with the guard, the first time I read it, I was thrown a little bit by Quartermain and Mina's reaction because Quartermain would have killed the guard just as well. Just Griffin slit the throat and Griffin did it the right way. But as you, know, you do the multiple read-throughs, you start looking and start thinking like Quartermain. You start thinking like Mina. And it was, you know, for me, I kind of took it as part of, you, know, you mentioned how he's starting to get his sense of uh, honor, his sense of morality. But also, I think part of it was... The, he was so worked up on a protection mode of Mina uh-huh. that when Griffin did that sudden slit, I think he was seeing that Griffin could be a possible threat, a possible there could be a possible risk to Mina in there. And I'm th- I kind of took part of his anger and his resentment toward how Griffin handled the situation, not completely about that situation. He was thinking, you know, it was you know. He he was saying it's one thing, but he was actually reacting, you know, in another way. Because you see it in Mina chastises the guy chastises for killing him and then goes and strips a dead man of his clothing so they could use it as disguise. And Griffin even commented and saying, My, how admirably callous. You know, just commenting that, hey, you're sitting there chastising me for, you know, slitting the dude's throat from behind, yet look what you're doing. And I love seeing that. And that was really something the first time through I didn't completely get a firm grasp on everything. So definitely, you know, second, third read through is you see some of these conversations, you see some of this reaction and you start getting a voice in your head for the different characters, including Griffin. Now was that helter shelter thing on purpose? I mean, I know it was the, sh- it was the same shelter word that was covered up by Jekyll as he was walking yeah. along. But if you see the two panels together, it's helter shelter, which, you know, the whole thing with, the whole prediction of the apocalyptic war and all that kind of stuff that Manson was. Do you think that stuff, do you think that was done on purpose or an accident? I, 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 in this book, I'm convinced that nothing is an accident. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm convinced nothing's an accident. That was probably done on purpose because of the whole Manson and all the apocalypse and the coming doom and all that. So, yeah. And it, it's funny, we're, as we're talking about Griffin, I just, you know, something else. Normally, with me and invisible characters, I kind of like. Oh, I see like in the Fantastic Four where you see a little outline of Sue Storm and you just have to know in your head that she's invisible. But the way they did the artwork here, I really like the fact that I never technically knew where Griffin was standing and that I never actually <laughs> ever saw his face. Oh, although that's not entirely true, <laughs> which right. we're going to oh, get yeah. to. And I love how that plays out. One of the things I really liked was how dialogue let you know he was there, but also the reaction of Jekyll. Jekyll's yeah. head turning to the sound of Griffin. Uh, You know, in that shelter panel, that was something that was really great to just kind of see, can't see him. Uh, I also liked Jekyll's fear that, you know, what if I can't churn? What, you know, what happens to me if I don't become Hyde? Uh, You know, and and that's, uh, it shows that Jekyll really, it's the reason why he needed to become Hyde is because Jekyll as a man is really a a fraidy cat, you know, and he's to hide is his courage hide and th- that duality is part of the problem courage and um anger and all that unchecked by the other side of jekyll is why hide is so dangerous and why you know hide has no uh, <laughs> filter and no off switch uh it, it is funny that's that that's that kind of incredible hulk duality that we've seen before but that was what the classic jekyll and hide story comes from <laughs> i did like in this story though that we did see a lot more of Jekyll present in Hyde in this most recent transformation when he starts to calm down 
we see that there's a smart man there. But he's a calmer, more confident man than Jekyll was. Well, and it was fun, funny because I was talking to Brother Bill about this because he's actually read the original Jekyll and Hyde story, mm-hmm. and it's one. It's on one. The, he has a list of books that I need to read. He's like, when, you know, there's other stuff other than comic books for you to read. The the Jekyll and Hyde story is one of them, and he was saying how that in the story they know obviously they know about each other, but Hyde also was able to blackmail Jekyll. And there was a lot of stuff going on with that way where it was his own, he's not only fighting his own inner demons, but he's got this other physical presence that's trying to take him down. And I thought, you know, and I'm like, damn, that's kind of neat. And we kind of see the emotional, we see the bleed through in this story. Well, that that crafty character that Hyde was in that, because I've read the original, and that crafty character that Hyde was in that story is something you're seeing here with how he handles Griffin. Because he doesn't reveal to Griffin that he can see him. And why wouldn't he do that? Because he's trying to figure out if there's a way he can use it. And I love that, you know, we don't see that play out in this. But I love that Hyde is just sitting there smart. He never reveals it. Um, throwing out the wherever you are. You know I can't see you. You know, this repeated references to the fact as they are traveling together that he has no idea where Griffin's at. He can't see Griffin. I love that it's a side effect, though, of his transformation is that he can see the heat signature. And that's yes. just, oh, so visually great um, that it was the heat signature that um, was kind of the giveaway for Griffin. And Griffin, as of the end of the series, you know, this first series, does not know that Hyde can see him clearly. <laughs> Well, I can, yeah, I liked seeing that Griffin kind of did suspect Hyde, and there was a couple times he tried tripping tripping him up by pointing to a direction, you know, saying, "Oh yeah, you go this way," and he pointed, and Hyde's like, "Hey, I remember, I can't see you." Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I think that whole time was Griffin thinking, "Hey, can this guy see me?" Because it was just you know, I, you know, when you think about Griffin's character, he's not of high moral character. He is a thief, a killer, a liar. He is a nasty, nasty person. And when you're that type of person, you're used to not trusting anybody. So naturally, he's not going to trust this monster. And if there's an indication, possibly, that, you know, because the one time Hyde did look in his direction, it's like, you know, kind of like, hey, can this guy see me? Let me throw out a test here. Let me see. And, you know, and does the point. And, you know, does a couple other extra stuff just to seeing if Hyde's following where he's going. And I like seeing that not only the intelligence of Hyde to conceal the fact that he can see him, but Griffin as well is, you know, not a 100% certain. So he's going to get some very I thought I that was a cool play. You and I read that totally differently because I didn't see a Griffin having any idea at all that Hyde knew, which I'm not saying you're wrong for that, but I was watching that sequence because when he mentions the mouth of the tunnel is over that way, that was before Hyde was looking at him. Hyde wasn't looking at him when he said that. He was saying that from behind Hyde because Hyde's back was to him uh, during that sequence. And it wasn't until Hyde turned around to look at him, you keep forgetting Griffin, I can't see him, that he said that. Mm-hmm. So I didn't take it that he knew. I thought this was uh, their way of showing us Hyde's enhanced senses because they didn't just show that Hyde had a visual sense increase, you know, in the sense that he could see um, like the heat spectrum. It also showed that his sense of smell was incredibly enhanced. You know, what a hole it stinks of Chinaman in the river. And, you know, Griffin comes back with, really, I can't smell anything. So we're, we're getting to here to know just that Hyde has these enhanced senses. And maybe, you know, there was meant to be some undercurrent. I'm not saying you're wrong. I didn't read it that way. That doesn't mean I'm right. Um, maybe there is some undercurrent that Hyde knew, and maybe that you know the way that you read it. I mean, I'm sorry that Griffin knew to a certain extent that maybe he thought, hey, maybe this guy's on to me, and and Hyde quickly threw him off the trail. Regardless, I, we're in firm, firm agreement. What was cool about that sequence event is you got to see the intelligence in this particular issue of both Griffin and Hyde yeah. in the way they reacted, because that is something whether Griffin knew or not is irrelevant to the fact that what we're seeing here is exactly what you're mentioning. Two very smart and crafty characters interacting with each other. And it's funny how these two actually are a really good team up together with, if, <laughs> if they could actually trust each other, uh, they complement each other in a v- wide variety of ways that I, I just thought that was incredibly oh, yeah. interesting. Yeah, definitely. That was a, you know, 
again, you know, just a, and it's funny because you sit there and you think about team ups throughout this whole thing that are happening, and you know, like you know, we have Quartermain and Mita, you know, going for the Cavarite. We have Hyde and Griffin starting up the uh, distractions, and it's you know, you got you know Nemo when he's going to later on be teamed up with Quartermain and Hyde, and it just I like seeing these characters interact and how they're dealing with each other, and it's it's a neat part of the story that it's not the story, but it is that little extra little add ons. I have a question for you seeing Hyde and just how like we've got Mina Harker and who's seen a a lot of horrible things, obviously. Um, And then you've got Quartermain who I'm sure is, you know, seen his share of horrors. This is a whole new level though. He's ripping a guy in half. The amount of carnage they walk out to with Hyde. You know, um, not only is he ripping people apart, he's stepping on people. He's already thrown people through knives in the wall. Uh, just, you know, the the kind of death, and, and he, you're talking about using his teeth and ripping arms off and stuff like that. It's just depravity, you know, violence. Would you be able to remember that that was Jekyll? Or, like, at what point in time do you draw the line and say, I can't be around this? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, they've got the Cavorite. You know, do you do you stick with Hyde at that moment? What do you do? Do you trust him? I guess is what I'm saying because you, you you want to escape. Is this the person you want to escape with? Yeah, see, that's a tough call because you know Mina understands, you know, and actually probably Quarterman as well would understand the bloodlust. You know, that's you know something when you know it. You know, one she's she's dealt with directly and just some of the nasty stuff. But even Quarterman, yeah, you know, when you're the when you're the hunter, when you're the warrior, you deal with that. But Hyde was at a level well beyond anything anyone could normally have thought was rational. And on one hand, I'm like, yes, I'd want the guy still on my side because of this power. But on the other hand, you got to look and say, you know, can you know, it's one thing having this much power, but if there's no control over it, if there's no, you know, restraint, what's to prevent him from doing that to me? So you got to really watch where you go and how you do and who you're with for these exact reasons. I'm a big fan of adventure stories where you see the characters, their backs against the wall and there's this incredible escape where they almost die. Uh, you know, cause I, I that, that's that reality we were talking about earlier where, I mean, they sure they use the cavalry and they blast themselves through the, the roof and, but they're sent so far into the air and they don't know how to use the thing that they're sent up too high. They come crashing down on the water and I loved that, you know, they were knocked unconscious, um, they had to be pulled out by Nemo's ship, because um, I loved the visual of them just floating on the surface and being brought in. If Nemo's ship hadn't popped out at the time, they would have been dead and done for. Mm-hmm. Oh, definitely. And, you know, one of the things I liked about that sequence, you know, again, improvise, adapt, overcome is always cool when you're seeing your heroes scramble. But when they're actually lining up and they're getting ready to go, I like that when Griffin was holding on to Hyde's neck, he squeezed a little bit tighter than everyone else, just kind of letting Hyde know, hey, I can hurt you. But, you know, as I'm reading this, I'm thinking, was it Hyde actually, did Hyde actually feel it or was Hyde playing? Was Hyde just giving Griffin a sense, oh, yeah, yeah, you could do damage to me and not actually feeling. I don't know. That's one of the things that got me thinking second and third read-throughs, little subtle stuff like that. Sure. And, you know, I also dig the little squabble that uh, Quartermain and Griffin, you know, kind of had. We're going back and forth. You know, that's, you know, in a way, I'm thinking that's setting up for a future throwdown, maybe. And so they, I'd kind of like to see. <laughs> I loved the bit when they gave everything to Campion Bond, you know, gave the... Um Cavalry over to him, and you see the the difference in like Jekyll. Everybody else is like wrapped up in towels and a robe or something like that, and, and warming up. But Jekyll's got to be like he looks more sickly than everybody else. He's got to be in the hot water. I mean, just yeah. so fits that character to sit there and say, you know, this is the wimp. Like he's the one you would just be grunting and groaning the whole time because he's a hypochondriac. Yeah, uh, which is the exact opposite of what Hyde is. Um, I just loved the visual of that, seeing him there looking just a little more sickly than everybody else, knowing that, sure, they're all cold from what happened, and you know they're all probably feeling you know under the weather and sick, but he's got to be a little bit more over the top than everybody else. But then this went to one of my favorite sequences, the whole thing. You see Griffin sitting there, and i got to mm-hmm. admit, um, when, when you and I started reading this for the first time again for the podcast, I got fooled again. 
And I mean, obviously now my most recent read through, I didn't because I had read it so recently. I didn't remember this bit uh, where Griffin wasn't there and he was following Campion. And I loved it because there was that great setup in the beginning with Nemo and his crew and realizing that Nemo and Griffin had had this discussion now. And, you know, this goes back to Nemo was listening to his crew. Griffin was now being brought in on this through Nemo. And, you know, we get to see these suspicions. And I loved, I loved again, what you're talking about. I thought it was far more interesting that we didn't see Griffin there. We saw characters' reactions to sounds. Campy and Bond saying that he heard something. Campy and Bond uh, wondering, questioning, looking behind him. Uh, It was a great visual choice. It was something a little bit different with the invisible character. I'm with you. I love seeing like little clouds around characters. I love seeing little shadow outlines. Whatever, you know, the kind of visual tricks they do to let us see invisible people. I'm a big fan of Sue Storm in the Fantastic Four. I loved how you can can kind of see, um, you know, a... uh, you know, kind of a transparent image of her, knowing that nobody else can see her, but that's our our point of reference as readers to know that's where she is. I dig that. I'm not against that. This was just kind of cool because it was something a little bit different in the approach, knowing that character was there. And I don't think it would work with a Sue Storm to see that every issue of the book. Because part of the thing with Sue Storm is you want to get to know her and see her that way. Griffin's just a different kind of character, and visually he works much better like this. Did you know at the end of this issue who it was? Moriarty? Well, I knew because I saw in the movie, and that was the only way I probably... Oh, I don't think I would have been first. able to guess it. Yeah. See, I didn't see the movie first, and um, I had forgotten it was Moriarty mm-hmm. when I read it for... Because I didn't watch the movie in our first read-through for this until after I'd read it again. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I forgot that the person was Moriarty. <laughs> yeah, it, I, I honestly, I, I'd like to say that, oh, yeah, I would have figured it out. I probably wouldn't have. Just by him saying, call me James, I wouldn't have figured it out. I would have said, James, James. And it, I, I would have still been, you know, thinking about it. And then, you know, on the next issue, like, oh, damn, I'm an idiot. But, you know, because I'd seen it in the movie, because he was the villain in the movie, I knew exactly who it was. And, and it, the funny thing is it didn't ruin anything for me because I liked the fact that, how it played out in this and how they kept going through M and she kept thinking it's Mycroft Holmes and all, and they just kept, how they kept playing it and keeping you thinking it's that. And then and you get the big reveal at the end. It was, I, I liked that. I, I thought it was a great, again, really cool story play out that you have all this action. You have all this neat story stuff going on. That's fun and entertaining. And then you find out, bam, surprise. That's not the full story. Here's the full story. And then, even when we find out the full story later, we're going to find out there's still another piece of the story. And I loved how this thing keeps building on this, this. Just when you think you know all the answers, they change the questions on you. It was absolutely wonderful. Well, telling us that something new about Moriarty, I thought was really cool about this whole thing. Finding out that um, you know Moriarty wasn't, he was a bad guy, but you know there's that gray area. Because he was hired by the government to be that kind of image uh, to, you know, to help their police force to, you know, I mean, it was, it was this whole kind of way of controlling the underworld through Moriarty. And, you know, what point in time do you become power man? And what point in time, I think this happens. You see this in a lot of movies and, and novels and things about undercover work where, you know, there comes a point where somebody has been undercover too long. They start to make friends with the people on the other side, start to play the role just a little bit too well. And I give a lot of credit to people who do any kind of real, true undercover work because I can't imagine what that's like to play a character where you're living a life. You know, we're not talking about on TV or film and, uh, you know, you're, you're talking about TV and film people at some point in time, I guess their characters would bleed over as well, but that comes to an end. You know, you're not living that life. You eventually have the end of your shooting day, and you can go back to the real world. I guess this is a a um, method acting <laughs> yeah. taken to a whole new level for Moriarty, and I loved that just little twist because it, it just it it fit. Um, I'm a big fan of Sherlock Holmes. It's funny though; I've only read one of Conan Doyle's books, and it was later in my life. Growing up, I was a big fan of Sherlock Holmes through television. Film, audio, even it actually came from a Batman book and record set, which I've mentioned on the show before, 
uh, as a kid. You know, I had a giant Batman book and record set with the team up with the two of them. But I was very young when I got that. So I, I became a fan of Holmes and I started following Holmes. But it really was, like I said, through media that I got to know the character. And a lot of the adaptations, I'm talking about the media ones, um, the library, there was a Wycliffe Public Library, which was, um, you'll know it, it was it's in Ohio. They had the audio cassettes of radio plays of Sherlock Holmes that were based on Conan Doyle's books. So I would, you know, get those out of the library, take them home, I'd listen to them. Loved it. I mean, great mystery. Loved the character. Uh, you can't help but dig Sherlock Holmes. So when this sequence hit in issue five, this was something that I wish had been in the film. I would have loved to have seen the confrontation between Sherlock Holmes and Moriarty play out yeah. visually on screen because I thought this was absolutely brilliant. The two, you know, it was two villains from a proper era where there's a certain, you know, gentleman's contest between the two, um, you know, this need to be civilized. Yet, you you know, through the whole time, you knew this cocky Moriarty was on some level not going to be afraid to do everything he possibly could to defeat Holmes, but it was his ego. Needing to defeat Holmes equally, one-on-one, -on -one, uh, not to get him behind the back or anything like that. Moriarty needed to believe he was better than Holmes. And I always like those kind of villain-hero relationships where you've got these two, you know, letting him write a letter to Watson, yeah. letting him leave his uh, case there. Uh, but then in true villain fashion, when that went awry, we see Moriarty, Moriarty's true colors. <laughs> Shoot him down. <laughs> He's trying to fake his death. Shoot him down. <laughs> well, and I tell you again, it's just the, the civil the civility between the two of them. And it's part of that that proper, you know, English, you know, proper British gentleman, you know, the way they carry themselves. And it's I always thought it was like just a really cool way to tell someone to go pound salt was, you know, with a British accent or with that you know, that prim and proper type of style to it. But the thing I digged about this whole thing, not only what, did we get this great reaction between these two villain, these two um, arch nemesis, we, in that letter, that, that final letter that Holmes gets to write, we get to see part of it. And we get to see enough details that, you know, it, you can tell there's evidence, he's telling more, um, Watson where the evidence is to put Moriarty away, but it's also a heartfelt farewell to his friend. So it's a combination. There's still the great detective. He's still making sure that Moriarty gets put away. He's still making sure what's right is right and what happens. But there is still that, you know, that emotional response from him. And I liked how that, you know, Moriarty, you know, had the female pretend to be sick to pull Watson away from the situation. And they each acknowledge and he's like, I appreciate that. That was, you know, good of you to do that. And it was just a nice, it was just a really cool banter, uh, almost a friendly banter where if these two... If it, situations had been slightly different, these two actually could be friends and allies. But because of who they are, because of where they're at, because of their positions in life, they're they're mortal enemies. And it's you know kind of a, you think about the uh, Superman Lex Luthor rivalry and mm -hmm. hatred. Those two, if those two ever work together, could do amazing things. If Holmes and Moriarty were ever able to work together, who knows what they could have accomplished? It's I like seeing that out of bitter you know rivals. Joker Batman. I always yeah. liked, uh, you know, one of the, why is Killing Joke one of my favorite stories? It wasn't what happened to Barbara Gordon. And, and that's the funny part. It was the end sequence with the two. It, it was, uh, that whole thing was a frame. But, um, you know, I mean, it framed the whole series. You know, this, this um, meeting of the minds between the two. You know, are we going to eventually both kill each other? You know, is that the only way this can end between the two of us? At the end, when the two of them are, are having that conversation between them, you know, where Batman finally chuckles at the Joker's joke. Yeah. It was that meeting like this. It was like this, the duel, you know, between two adversaries that know that neither will give up, neither will bend, and, and that the ending is not going to be good for them. Maybe one, maybe both. Um, you know, and, and, and that's the way that their story's just destined to go. Uh, I, I always liked that sense of, um, you know, the black and white, the, uh, you know, the, the one's the white cowboy, one's the black hatted one. It's that kind of feel that fits. I don't need that in every character that's ever created, but it's, I think in certain timeless characters and in new ones that are created too, you'll get those well-crafted villains that do feel like full true adversaries. 
in some ways, you know, while I feel it's the Joker for Batman, I do feel Ra's al Ghul has that kind of thing. But every time I say that because of my love of Ra's al Ghul, I do go back to the Joker. Uh, and mm -hmm. and uh, I think Ra's maybe the adventurer side of Batman is totally the true adversary there. But there is something about the Joker's chaos to the Batman's constant quest for order that I think the two of them are the yin and yang. And that, that's really where their relationship works. And we see it here with Moriarty. Um, and it, to the point where I loved seeing how this wound up being a, a journey to present day with Campy and Bond. Because uh, I, I, I didn't remember in my returning to this series that Campy and Bond was in on everything. Like he knew. I didn't realize you know, that he was involved with the death of Holmes, uh, that he was you know, so totally in. Cause I guess I kept linking to James Bond. I was thinking that, you know, this was going to wind up being more of a character who is outside of it, uh, maybe a victim of circumstance. Totally forgot that, no, no, Campion's completely in on the whole thing. He's the general. He's his Watson. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's the thing, interesting thing you said. You said the death of Holmes. Mm -hmm. To be honest, we never see that guy kill Holmes. Oh. I'm, I don't think Holmes is dead. I think, you know, there's a chance Holmes is still alive out Good there. Good point. Yeah, just because of, you know, who Holmes is and how cool of a, you know, he, he's not easily killed. And the fact that it occurs off screen, you know, for me is the indicator that he's still around. Right. And, I pre and that was something I really did appreciate. Plus, I liked Moriarty's sense of overkill. You know, he's like, don't just shoot him, drop a boulder on him. <laughs> <laughs> now, after we get through that whole Moriarty sequence and we see Griffin again, the brutality of the murders. It's one of the things about um, the danger, I think, of invisibility. I, it's a power I would, first of all, I think would naturally drive you mad because people can't see you. And, and we know that this is something that um, Griffin can't control. So you've got like this deviant situation where nobody can see you. Uh, what are the consequences of your actions? You can run away. You can go anywhere. Nobody's going to know. And we knew that right from his introduction of this whole thing. But the way he kills the guy, um, you know, his sense of consequence, um, we all hold back for a variety of reasons. First of all, I, w I couldn't do that to another person, what he did. Yeah. Um, that's, I, I could never be wired that way. Um, I would, I'm not saying I couldn't knock somebody out and take their outfit to kind of do part of you know, what he's trying to do. Uh, I, I get part of the point there. You know, he was cold and everything like that, so I, I get what he was doing. But it's, you know, killing somebody with the brutality that he did just to warm up uh, shows who this character is. And, and the point where he was willing to so justify it with the whole crew was amazing. It's funny because, you know, when um, we see Griffin, you know, we you know, Griffin was there the whole time and, you know, the return trip. Part of me, you know, did wonder if Griffin had followed Bond because he was a, he was not because Nemo sent him, but was this going to be the double cross? Because I always thought Griffin is very capable of doing the double cross at any time. Yeah. And the return trip proves that he's capable of doing it every one. You see the animal, you see the monster in him. You know, it's you talk about Hyde being a monster and he is, but Griffin here that he enjoy you could you, we couldn't see his face, but you could tell he was smiling and laughing as he was bludging this police officer to death. And, you know, it was just way beyond overkill, where I laughed before at the level of overkill that Moriarty had. This overkill, I didn't, you know, it wasn't funny. It wasn't, you know, it was more of a, whoa, kind of, that's a cop. That's a good guy. What the heck are you doing here? This, there's, there's it just, it was one of those things that it kind of had a reaction you know, that visceral reaction, and, you know, you, st you start thinking about all, all this stuff that Griffin has done throughout the series, and you're like, yeah, this guy is a heartless killer. He is the, he is evil. <laughs> Why do you think Griffin didn't stick with Moriarty? See, I, I have my own theory on it, but what, do you, what is your thing? Why did your take? Because I agree with you, there, there was that option there for Griffin to turn. Why do you think he didn't? See, that's, that was the thing that part of me was wondering, I couldn't figure out. Yeah, See, because, I, have a, I have a theory on it. So, oh, okay, I'd, I'd like to hear your theory because, with me, I was sitting there and I was trying to come up with a reason, and the only thing I could come up with is that you know Griffin had to choose which side could help him the most, yes, and which side could actually cure him. And following the heroes who say yes, we'll try to cure you is usually a better bet than going with the bad guy who's <laughs> saying yes, I'll try to cure. You. 
That's exactly what I was going. Amen. Yeah. That's exactly where I was going with it. I don't see, like, hearing that conversation about the freaks and everything like that towards the end, I don't think that there is a, I think Moriarty's out for himself. I don't think in any way, shape, or form he'd help Griffin. Uh, I think Griffin knew that. I think, because Griffin, I think being the fact that exactly what you said is 100% true, he would turn on a dime. I think he recognizes similar like-minded people. And I think that seeing them, he just knows, I'm not going to get what I'm looking for yeah. here. <laughs> so it really, I, he came back for selfish reasons. Uh, I, you and I saw that exactly the same way. Uh, and why, why wouldn't he? This conversation with the whole crew, we're seeing now, you went from a situation where you had a, a sort of a defined leader in Mina Harker. But now all of a sudden, you see that Nemo has been behind the scenes kind of undermining her authority. Alan Quartermain agreeing with him to a certain extent, and that bothering Mina because they're all kind of overtaking her. They didn't yeah. consult with her. And, and it, as a true leader, I agree with what she's saying. I was the leader, you know, of this thing. You know, it's you should have come to me first. We should have. I should have been involved. I shouldn't have been the last to know. This shouldn't be the way that you know things turned out. And she's realizing quickly that in this era, they're not respecting her authority and what she brought to the table. And I, I agree with her for being angry on that, because I do think that as a leader of the group, she's been doing a good job. And I think that she deserves a little respect. And I think it's a sign of the era that they just went ahead and, and did this and didn't take her. I think they took her seriously to a certain extent, but not enough to give her full leadership. Do you think if, if she were a guy, I'm, I'm asking this, in that era, that she would have been taken more seriously by them and they would have consulted her first? Or do you think that their egos are what's getting in the way here? Or do you think I, it's a little of A and B? I think Nemo does what Nemo wants to do. I think if they, if Mina had been a guy, he still would have sent Griffin the spy. Mm -hmm. There's no. It wasn't about Mina's gender that made them not consult. It was ne Nemo said thought, this is the right thing to do. This is what I'm going to do. And he honestly... While he does have some trust, I think he does trust Mina and Quartermain, he still doesn't know 100% where everybody's at. So it's best if nobody else other than him and Griffin knew and his crew knew. I'm sure that, you know, Ishmael and uh, uh, the Broadback uh, Arrow guy, you know, they, he knew as well. And I think they knew that Griffin was going out to spy, but he didn't trust the other league members just because. You know, you got to, you know, you keep who, you know, when you're doing like a little sneaky peek kind of a maneuver like this, you got to, you know, limit who you're dealing with, limit who knows. And it's better that way. And I thought for me, I read this not as well. It was she's seeing it as a power struggle, but I didn't read it as part of Nemo not trusting Nina. I think he just this is how he is. Well, this is who he is. How can you not say that, though, when he says things like, for my part, she's no more distressing than most Western women. They all disobey their men and dress like whores. I mean, what I'm saying is that's his view of women in general is defined in that sequence of events. That's why I'm, I'm throwing out there. I, I agree that he would have done the same thing if it was a guy, but you know that dialogue says a lot. Quartermain, on the other hand, is trying to get information about her past because we get to see there, even though she's, he's quote-unquote infuriated by her, that Jekyll hit the nail on the head. He is a little smitten. He wants to know, what was it like? She was married once. What happened with that whole thing? So I think we get to see in that moment, though, that Nemo clearly does not respect women. Well, yeah. Well, that, hold on. That's, yeah, I'm not saying that he, it's, okay, yeah. There's definitely that side of Nemo. But for me, the whole Griffin thing wasn't about Mina. You know, it's not even about, you know, her not being the leader, not being, you know, him respecting her. It mm -hmm. was literally for him, he sees it in a different way. And it's part of that whole captain mentality. It's that he's in charge of his ship. He's the final say in the matters. No You're, matter what, whoever that leader was, he was always going to do what he thinks is the exact right thing to do. That isn't what I'm saying. I agree with everything you're saying. Okay. We're 100% on the same page as far as that's concerned. I, what I'm saying is, do you think if it was a guy, Nemo would have taken that guy into confidence with what was going on? Because I got the feeling that Mina was one of the only people that didn't know. <laughs> when, Quartermain uh, didn't know. Quartermain and, uh, and Jekyll didn't know. But 
that Griffin went. They I, were all, everyone was all shocked. Right. But what I'm saying is, it seemed like Nemo was trying to bring Quartermain, because you see him having these, and I agree with that, but what I'm saying is Nemo seems to be having these long, lengthy conversations with Quartermain throughout the series. Like, after that whole sequence of events, he pulls him into his confidence, starts talking to him. He doesn't do that with Mina. And I don't remember seeing him do that at any point in time in the series where he's having long, lengthy conversations with Mina like he has with Quartermain. There's a different relationship there. We see Quartermain talking to Mina. We see Jekyll talking to Mina. We don't necessarily see Nemo doing that. Right. I, I guess I'm, what I'm saying is I'm complimenting the writing because I really felt that there was a multi-layered thing that was going on with Nemo and how he was handling Mina in that situation. It wasn't just leaving her out of the loop with, I don't think he would have ever revealed it to her. I believe there's a possibility if he was sitting across the table from Quartermain, he would have revealed it to Quartermain, uh, you know, if he could have ahead of time. It wouldn't have been in the sense that he was looking for approval from Quartermain. I mm-hmm. think it would have been out of respect to say, hey, you know, I think there's something up. I think he would have felt out Quartermain. I think he would have told him. I don't think there was any possibility he would have ever told Mina ahead of time. And I think that's exclusive to her and perhaps Jekyll. <laughs> yeah, and- and let me, yeah, I agree with you on Nemo's stance towards uh, Mina, and definitely, and as well as Jekyll. It's, you know, so we are in agreement there on that, that, you know, yeah, Nemo looked, you know, definitely looks down at Mina and looks down at Jekyll, both of them, you know, because of his appearance, his, you know, what he appears to be weaker people than him. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's the whole with Western women, which is their, uh, you know, with undisciplined and just the way they are. And just then with Jekyll, you see kind of like he sees him not as, you know, as a man. He's like, you know, basically he can probably basically he probably wants to go up to him, smack him around a couple of times, tell him act like a man, stand up straight. Yeah. But, you know, it's there's definitely is that, you know, Nemo, uh, Mina, you know, resentment and, you know, disagreement. But what I liked about it, when you look at when the story takes place in the late 1800s, you know, I liked that Mina was written as this very strong female who you believe should be the leader. And that was something that I thought was really important to me, you know, that I, 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 I'm defensive of her because I'm like, you know, I, she's a good leader. She's a good coordinator. I think she, you know, will listen to the other people, try to get their ideas. Uh, there's something strong with her about a leader where Nemo, on the other hand, while he's, he might be a good captain, that doesn't necessarily always mean you're a great leader, if you follow my viewpoint. Oh, definitely. You know, definitely. I, I think his personal viewpoints get in the way of what he's doing. And I really liked the distinction that this is an era where somebody like Nemo can be very comfortable throwing those things out. And there aren't a whole lot of, like, nobody, def- like, during that sequence of events, quarter main is clearly smitten with Mina to a certain extent, even though he hasn't totally revealed it. He doesn't say boo when Nemo throws that out there. And he actually tries to stay out of it, but when he's pushed, he does admit that he liked the idea of Griffin going. You know, he it's right. you know, and he didn't want to throw it out there, you know, because that kind of shows his smitten with her. But, you know, in the end, when you look at it logically, it was a good play. Oh, it, at 110% was. And I don't think her issue with it ever was that it was done. I think it was that she was left out of it. Yeah. Oh, big time. Yeah. And I like the fact when Mina and Jekyll are having their heart-to-heart, she's madder at Quartermain than at Nemo. Yeah. And even Jekyll points this out to her, saying, hey, you're madder at Quartermain. He didn't do anything to you. Which, and I think it was that she took it personally yeah. uh, that this all happened. You know, when... Well, when Quartermain and Mina start going out there, that expedition, the Dr. Dr. Samuel Ferguson expedition, it's actually yeah. from a Jules Verne book, Five Weeks in a Balloon. Oh, cool. So that balloon comes from that. I looked that up because um, was, it was funny during this read-through, and I know I'm not catching every little tiny thing. Um, it's been my experience when I've read League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Every time I've gone through, I noticed some little tag, some little something that made me go on the internet. I'm not going to pretend that I discovered this, that, you know, I knew that that's where Daniel, Dr. Samuel L. Ferguson was from. It was, uh, it was from reading this story and then finding other things out. And then from listeners have called in and pointed out things that we've missed. Uh, I love when stories give me a reason to go back. I'm a fan of Zucker Abram Zucker's airplane, top secret airplane Two, uh, mm-hmm. pol- you know, police squad. Uh, the, I watched police squad when it was on when I was a kid and, and I've loved that. And one of the things that I loved about their comedy 
was every time you watch it, there's something new you notice in the background, some little sight gag, some little joke. Now, this is done in a more serious literary form, but it has that same kind of value where every time you read League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, you notice some reference to literature that you didn't notice before. And I, I just love those tiny details. And it's all literature from the era of this series, you know, right around the the time frame of this storyline, which I thought was terrific. Mm hmm. Well, you know, one of the things I thought was kind of cool when the team starts scrambling and they realize that it is Moriarty and everything starts playing out there. The one of the things I saw, the cabbie that takes a quarter main and Mina, is it me or is that Sherlock Holmes? You look at this the way he's drawn. It, first, you know, when I was looking at it, I was like, is that Sherlock Holmes? That's why I mentioned earlier that we don't see him dead. I, I actually was kind of thinking maybe that could be him, oh, that and chin, he's somehow involved. Look at that chin, dude. That's way too big. Well, you think about just you know as time has gone on, you know, or who knows what happened to him when the the one dude gets a hold of him. They're trying to drop a boulder on him. I don't know. It just that was the first thought that popped in my head. Take what a look if? at the nose. Go back to the beginning though, and take a look at the nose structure of Sherlock Holmes. And I mean, th the face just doesn't match. Like adding fat onto him, let's mm -hmm. let's go on because I'm buying into your theory on the whole adding the fat thing. But if you take a look at, um, he's tall and thin, and he's got that you know like the nose bridge that juts out. Uh, even if you add a little weight on him, there's certain things that just aren't going to lead to that kind of. It's a cool theory. I mean, I, I was I, I'm and if I didn't take it seriously, I wouldn't have looked. So, uh, but if you take a look at even the hair structure of him, um, even though he's got the hat on, if you take a look at it, mm -hmm. um, the nose is too small to be Sherlock Holmes because his nose isn't got, unless he got a nose job, and then maybe they put out his nose into his chin. But um, it, it was a cool enough theory to you know give you a hats off on that. I, I went and looked because <laughs> yeah. I'm like, wait a minute, I want to see, I want to compare. I just don't see the visual matching on any level. But it was, I'm like, well, it's, it's, that's a very interesting theory. But if you even take a look at Sherlock's hair. Um, yeah, I see the receding. Yeah. Which, I mean, in the hat, you're not necessarily going to see that. But um, you, you can clearly see this guy's got more hair than Sherlock does. Now, granted, Sherlock could have grown it longer on the sides. So I can even give you that one. But the nose is way too small to be Sherlock Holmes. And the art's been too consistent in this for that kind of a mis I don't think that they would have... Um, if they were going for that so blatantly, I don't think they would have hit it. That yeah, well, yeah, it would have been a little bit more obvious. Yeah, I think they would have hidden it. I think you know it would have been something where because there are there's a, a number of hidden things in here that are deliberately hidden. So I, I agree with you that we they might have even deliberately disguised him to the point where you know it would have to be your real savvy reader, um, yeah. which is why when you did it, I I didn't dismiss the idea. I looked because I'm like, whoa, Jim's got a cool idea going here. Uh, so let me check. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I looked. So, I mean, it really is a compliment to your idea. Uh, I just, I don't see that being the case. Um, yeah. now, it was cool. Now the, the other thing I was thinking of with Mina's reaction when they realized that Moriarty has been playing them, you know, is, you know, is she, she's really beating herself up over this. Mm -hmm. Now, I was wondering, part of her beat up of herself is the fact that Nemo is the one who first put it, who puts it everything together. You know, Mina's starting to piece the pieces together, who is M, but it's Nemo who actually says Moriarty, who actually does come and puts everything together. Right. And I, I like that, you know, especially with the stuff we saw earlier with, you know, with her seeing, you know, that he kept her out of, you know, that he kept her out of the loop for the whole um, Griffin thing. Now we have this, another just kind of attack on her uh, command, attack on her leadership. Well, also, though, taking it one step further from what you're saying, She's also been involved the longest with Moriarty. In many ways, she was the one duped to bring everyone together for Moriarty. So it, it goes, it's, it's like a double-edged sword that's like shoved into her on this one because you've got what you're saying there, and I agree, that'll be a bruise to the ego, the fact that this Nemo who has you know, kind of overstepped her bounds, her authority here, and didn't include her, um, basically dismissed her, but there's also the fact that she's feeling responsible for and feeling with cake. I mean, imagine you put together this team. You think you've done this wonderful, noble thing. Think about her life. You know, she was mm -hmm. a victim of the vampire. 
Dracula. You know, and was this was her chance to make something of herself, some chance for redemption. She's been duped again. She's been victimized again, this time by Moriarty and Bond with what they did to her. They used her. They manipulated her. They put her in a position that she was looking at this as her opportunity to step out from that. Now she's been thrust into that again. So it works psychologically on another level from her as well, which I thought was really deep on the whole thing. And I found myself really liking the character of Mina through all this because I thought that we got to see um, how a strong woman, who is clearly somebody that I, I thought was one of the more rational ones, <laughs> for as yeah. rational as you can be after you've taken, you know, the, we know what she, has happened to her at the hands of Dracula. But there was some, out of, out of everybody, I thought she was the most balanced and mm-hmm. the most reasonable. I do think that if, if I was looking for a confidant out of this group, Quartermain would be a close second to her, which I can understand the attraction between the two of them. Because of the fact that the two of them, I think, could, could actually have a conversation. Nemo's got too big of an ego. I feel that Nemo would listen to what I was going to say, but Nemo ultimately is has got this irrational need to follow what Nemo wants to do, which is what you were alluding to earlier, and I agree. With, I could not agree with you more in your theory on that. And Nemo sticks to his guns, his prejudices, and everything to a fault, uh, which is ultimately Nemo's weakness, his own narcissism. But when you get to Mina, I'm like, this is somebody who, after everything that she's gone through in her life, you could actually relate to her, and she's been victimized again. Yeah. And, and I immediately feel for her. Um, I want to see her win. I want to see her be able to overtake this. I love seeing her and Quartermain kind of go off on their own because we get a chance to see the two characters who I really believe are the most rationally together out of this band of misfits because they've all got major issues. Uh, see them kind of get together and, and get to, in many ways, I think that's the victory of this whole thing, was by the end of this, the two of them, I think come out of this the most well adjusted <laughs> for for however much you can consider well adjusted at the end of the series. <laughs> yeah, yeah. These, you know, it's you know, it's funny seeing the 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 just the the dialogue back and forth between the two of them. One of the thing I really liked that my first read through, I took it as the fact that Quartermain was smitten with Mina was, you know, how he was kind of like, Hey, don't beat yourself up over it. You know, we were all duped and he's trying to make her feel better. And my first read through was because of that. And then as I started reading through multiple times through, I kind of got a different feel for him. Yeah, there is always going to be part of that, but I thought I, I, you see kind of like a respect, you know, and a camaraderie ship and just the he doesn't see her as just some woman you know he sees her as you know a friend as an equal as a teammate and you know i that's kind of like a quarter main you know a i, I want to say a leadership type of quality that quarter main has but it's not even just that it's just that whole good team dynamics when you start seeing your team fall you got to keep them up you got to make sure everyone's firing on the same page and everyone's together and she's not you know thinking about just how she's failed, she's focusing on the task at hand. And I love seeing that equality between the two of them. Now, and I agree with you on that. I actually do, I will put a little disclaimer on everything I said earlier. I do think by the end of this, with everything these characters went through to survive, I think that they're all changed and their relationships with each other have all been changed to a certain extent. I don't think they're all the same way Quartermain and Mina's relationship are, mm-hmm. with the respect you're mentioning, but I do think that there is a bit of a change to that for everybody. Um, one of the things I do want to make sure I note, um, on the streets when we see that initial um, flight of the aircraft, yeah. um, Dodger is uh, from Dickens' Oliver Twist. Yes, that was player. awesome. That was really, really sweet. Um, that was an, that was another one where I thought that was the case. I wasn't a hundred percent sure. And the great thing about all these people that do these wonderful websites, if, and you can search for them uh, doing a search for League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. There's so many websites that have wonderful anecdotes of things that they found from. Um, and and I know we didn't catch all of them. The only ones I'm referencing on this were the ones that either I knew or like Samuel Ferguson. I didn't know, but I'm like that's got to be something. And I went and looked for them on the net because of it. Uh, yeah. You know, there's so many more to be found in this series that um, I, I encourage you to uh, keep, keep looking and keep trying to find things hidden in the background. Feel free to call in with anything that you personally noticed that we missed. Cause um, 
we'd love to have you a part of the discussion on this. But it was one of the thing, one of the things I got to throw out there mm-hmm. in that panel when we're seeing Moriarty's ship for the, you know, really for the first time, there's a guy who has the blind sign who's all, who you know saying he's blind is looking up and looking at the ship. Yeah, I yeah. loved seeing that. <laughs> that was really that was a cool little uh, bit as well. I liked when they were actually landed on the ship because there was this whole question like, are we really doing this on a balloon? Uh, I loved that they're going in the middle of this out and out war where you just, you know, it's, it's all going crazy and haywire. But when she goes to bring Hyde out, that was the vampire power, right? That she was hypnotizing him. Cause she looks, I mean, she looks him square in the face or, or was that something? Cause her eyes, um, they, there's like a like you, there's a real difference in confidence in the way she's standing there. Or was that, Hyde just respecting and letting her go. I, I didn't. I didn't get what happened there. How did? You know, how did you take that? That was a tough one for me because you know you see her smacking him to get the to get the monster out, and then when he's initially there, he starts pretty much crushing her arm. Mm-hmm. And you know my initial reaction was vamp influence, but then I started thinking about who Mina is. I started thinking about some of the characteristics we're seeing in Hyde, and just the fact that you know a strong you see her. You know, she could probably talk him down. And I think, you know, I'm still not 100% whether that's a vamp influence or if that was just the, her strength of her character was able to get Hyde down and was sure. able to keep Hyde from ripping her arms off or trying something. I thought that, again, that was a great moment where, you know, later on, you know, when we actually learned all the details about her, that'll be another moment where you go back and reread through it and you start looking at it. And it was actually something that had me thinking, did she is she actually part vampire in this uh, series? Because throughout the whole time in the movie, she is. She's a vampire in the movie, and in here, I'm like, is she or was she just a victim of it? And she's still human, you know? Is it you know? So there's always moments of doubt in my mind that until I actually read it in the story, I'm not going to know for certain whether she's full on vamp or whether she's you know just a person who's been through a horrible thing and has come out stronger for. It. Yeah, um, it's it was something interesting about it. Was, as you were saying that, I'm like, well, I could see it the way Jim saw it, too. So uh, there's nothing I really have to say to argue with that. And the other part I was thinking about, what if it's Jekyll? You know, because look at her relationship with Jekyll. The two of them have sat down. We know Jekyll's got a little bit of a, a thing for her as well. But also, she's been very kind to him. Mm-hmm. You know, where they'll sit down together and she will talk to him, and which he isn't getting a lot from the rest of the team. You know, that, that sense of respect, that sense of, um, you know, confidants, you know, where she, you know, she shared with him her feelings when everything was going down, which I think for Jekyll was probably a boost in the right direction. So I wonder if that's not even part of it. I don't know. It was it was something that I found incredibly interesting that it, it's another layer to the story where depending on your viewpoint, you can interpret it your own. I, I like it. It wasn't spelled out. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, I, I, kinda, I like gray areas. Yeah, and it's you know it's something that it gives you the point of argument or discussion. And if someone were to say no, you know, saw an interview and it's one hundred percent this, I'd be like oh, okay. Or if someone said no, it's this, I really you know both stories I think make are a cool part of it. I do too. So I'm not sitting there saying it must be this or it must be that. I I actually embrace it and I like the unknown factor of it. The fact that yeah, I I enjoy that. Normally I want definite answers on stuff but with this one i like the mystery i like the unknown i like thinking hmm it could be this what about this and maybe there's somebody who has a complete third you know option out there it's it kind of uh fun and exciting where you can think outside of the title outside of the written words when you were talking about friends and characters like that in the story that was something that stood out for me you know when you talk about friends you you and i have mo- lots of friends that we share in common and you and I have had debates over friends that <laughs> it's not necessarily a negative thing but you know where we're seeing I'm seeing one thing one way you're seeing another thing another way and it really is us looking from the outside in in both of those cases where just based on our experience with that friend we are seeing it a little differently and, and it's never really an, and like you said there's that third possibility that we're both wrong or that there's a little bit of a a little bit of b but that was something when you talked earlier in the story about how these characters came to life. The fact that I care 
to debate what was going on with Mina <laughs> and Jekyll there is proof that these characters started to come to life for me. And it was as the story developed more and more, you got to see that. Uh, I loved that, um, you know, Quartermain's doing the guy thing. He's manning up. This is a guy who before, with the fight with Fu Manchu, was, you know, really pulling out his gun and stepping up only to keep them hidden. Now he's fully back to being Alan Quartermain. He's taking, you know, a, a more active role. He is the one saying, hey, I'm going to handle this, Mina. I'm going to take care of this whole thing. And you know, Moriarty gets the one up on him. This is the guy that, you know, either killed or didn't kill Sherlock Holmes through, yeah. uh, you know, his slimy antics. But this gives Mina the opportunity to, you know, smash the Cavorite, Um, which I don't know that that's the brightest thing to do when you're on a giant <laughs> flying ship to take the one thing that's keeping you up in the sky and smash it out of there. And I loved how that became a problem. I love that sense of we got to run. We got, you know, we've got to make it back to the balloon because it's really the only thing holding us up. And how long is that going to work out? Uh, considering the situation, I loved that this moved after that. Like that situation happened, there wasn't a whole lot of time to think. There was urgency, urgency, urgency. Oh yeah. Panel, panel, panel. Move, move, move. Um, you know, we got Griffin ready to leave everybody behind. You know, how are ready we get... to? He already started cutting the rope. Oh yeah. I loved seeing that on him. <laughs> <laughs> Which goes back to what we said earlier. You know, there's no loyalty with him. Um, sure, he will stick with them as long as it's it's convenient and serves his purposes. But that fits that. But I love the I loved the question of can we take Hyde with us? He's too heavy, and and they end up crashing because of that. Uh, it was it was something the whole thing the way it played out you know we got these characters at the end who are battered including Nemo you know where Nemo's got his arm broken because mm-hmm. of their crash it was something that I just loved about the ending nothing was clean about it um, it it wasn't really that they won and captured Moriarty you know the question is what happened to Moriarty very similar to what you mentioned with Holmes it's it's interesting how um, I was reading it that Holmes was dead and done for but seeing Moriarty drift off makes you wonder. Is he the only one? Yeah. Um, did Holmes really just kind of give up the life? And I, I loved that that was something that um, in this read through, your mentioning your thoughts on Holmes really made me question. Well, what does that mean for Moriarty then? Is he alive? Oh, Is he dead? And I like again endings like that where I think it's even more interesting if we never know. Yeah. Well, the thing with me with uh, Moriarty, mm-hmm. I really felt Moriarty died at the end of this. And the reason I thought those mystery behind Holmes as opposed to with Moriarty, you see that moment when Moriarty jumps on the Cavorite and then he just gets in his head, oh, yeah, this is going up. He's like, oh, and he, it's kind of one of those, he has that knee-jerk reaction to grab it. Then he goes, wait a minute, this is not a bright thing to do. It's kind of like that same thing Mina and, you know, um, Quartermain had when they when she gets a brilliant idea to smash it and yeah like oh no that's holding it up it's that what did I just do look on their face and because of that look that's what makes me think Moriarty's dead but but to be honest, as going back to your reference earlier if you go on the beginning of the story um, in issue five with Sherlock Holmes we don't see Sherlock Holmes killed but right. with everything that and his distance from them. And the great shot that Moriarty has with him, everything there would indicate that Holmes would have died. But we didn't see it. With any literature, film, comics, oh, yeah. whatever, anytime you don't see it, that leaves open the opportunity to explain why what we thought we happened did not happen. We don't have a body. Exactly. And you know, as I say that, I, I haven't read volume two yet i wanted to wait until we were done discussing volume one before i pulled out volume two before i got the other volumes because i wanted my only source of reference to be what's in volume one so maybe volume two if it shows that he's still alive i won't have an issue with it for that exact reason but it's you know it's one of those things where you just start looking at little piece here little piece here maybe this is it and um something else that actually as we're talking about little piece here that i just remembered you think back to when the league is exploring the ships and they come to that big steel door and Hyde rips it off the hinges. Mm-hmm. When he goes to approach it, he actually asks Mina to step aside and even says, please. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of a, to me, that kind of adds to the weight that there wasn't mystic powers, but it was well, just her. Hypnotism, though, dude, when vampires hypnotize somebody, that will change the way that person treats them later. 
So, I and wait, let me clarify this. I'm not disagreeing with anything you're yeah. saying. <laughs> I'm just saying that there is that other possibility still on the table from this. Uh, your possibility is just as valid. So this isn't in a disagreement. It's more of a saying there's still an A and B there. Oh, um, definitely. Yeah. Cause I, and I'm, but agreeing that your evidence is just as strong, so this isn't really an argument. It's more of a – that I don't, I don't think anything that we're seeing contradicts either possibility, uh, which, I, I again, goes back to what I love about this. I like gray areas. I like that we don't know. I like that I can sit there and, and I like that even though I felt the need to defend my point of view, I felt just as much need to defend yours because I like that because <laughs> yeah. I really feel both – both premises are just as strong, and I agree with your th- original th- with your theory that there's probably a third and fourth possibility oh, over what definitely. people how yeah. people are seeing that. I think that's cool. That's the great part about a gray area. Leave your readers like it's not necessary to know that. It's more interesting not to know. You know, I, I, that's uh, some. I, 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 sometimes it doesn't always have to be spelled out. I do like it when it is, and sometimes there's you know writers have a strong reason for spelling things like that out because it would be used later. In this case, it doesn't need to be spelled out right now. Uh, and that's and Volume 2, I read Volume 2, very similar to Volume 1, back in the day when it first came out. I haven't read it since. Yeah. Um, it's one that I'm anxious to read again because of this. I couldn't tell you much about Volume 2, uh, other than I remember greatly enjoying it. You know, it's that it's a similar, it takes place years later, yeah. but it's a similar premise. And that's something that happens with League. Like, I'm reading the current League, that the one that just came out um, from uh, Top Shelf. Yeah. They have two issues that have come out. They've both been fantastic, but I'm like, I've really got to go back and read Volume 2 uh, because I haven't read that in so long that I just I, I kind of want to reimmerse myself in the whole thing. But I did like that at the end it did wind up being Mycroft Holmes who ends up taking yeah. over um, that whole situation, uh, especially because he was referenced in the letter from Sherlock. And it actually, it does bring the whole connection back to Holmes and the connection. And I like that he's letting Bond stick around, even though he knows Bond is a bad guy. Because sometimes it's good to have treacherous people around you. You know, you, you need that sometimes, and especially with you look at what Moriarty was doing for you know for the government, where he was the government's bad guy. Well, now Bond's going to be the government's bad guy. You, you need to have that yin and yang. And I like seeing that. And it adds, again, to what I would expect a covert operation, a spy type of uh, group. I would expect MI, you know, MI6 to have this type of thing. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Look, at it's Alan and the Sundered Veil, that backup story. One of the things that I really enjoyed about that prose piece was, first of all, when I remember when this came out, I really felt there was an intense amount of value in the main story, having that there. But having this prose piece in the back, it was like, you're, I'm like, I'm getting a short novel in the back of this thing as well? How great was that? And it's a great Alan Quarter main story that does the same thing the main story does. It brings in characters like John Carter. It brings in Randolph you know, Carter. Uh, I, John Carter was particularly interesting right now because Disney's releasing a John Carter movie coming up. Uh, I was a big fan of H.G. Wells' Time Machine, so to have kind of like, you know, that whole time travel thing brought in, and I loved that we got to see Quartermain going through um, visions of, like, his first meeting with Mina, and then things from his future, you know, and, and we found out certain things from the story through those visions, and, and there are things that then um, do – I do know that there are some things that wind up popping up in the second volume of League that oh, were okay. visions in there as well. And I don't want to spoil anything like – because I know you haven't read the second volume. But there were things in his visions that also wind up popping up in the second volume of League that Quartermain witnesses, which reveals obviously that Quartermain is a part of the second volume. Um, it, it, was, it was a cool prose story in the back and it was something that I just really appreciate. I'm a big fan of those the same way that I was a fan of the ads through this whole thing. There was a lot of value in these books at the time they were expensive. You know, I mean, if you take a look at the cover price of these issues, it was two ninety five way back at uh, the end of uh, the beginning of 2000 issue six was released in 2000. Oh, okay. So, um, you know, two ninety five at that time was expensive. You know, we're holding the line at four cents yeah. more. I mean, <laughs> you know, so I mean, going back at the time, this was a premium book, but you got a lot of value in each issue with each issue containing the full issue. 
But then that prose piece in the back, all of the little fun little ad pieces and all that, there was a lot of story value to look back through. And I remember at the time not giving it a second thought on the price. And I think that was says a lot because it's a six issue series. It was two ninety five. It was a premium price, but I felt like you were be, you were giving getting a lot of content. And that was really true of the America's Best Comics line in general, from Promethea to Tom Strong to um, Tomorrow Stories to this. These were books that I really gray shirt was one that I really dug. Um, these were things that I really was into because they were well written. It was these cool new kind of universe um none of the books were interconnected it was just something that was fresh and neat and fun and they added kind of an adventure it's every, you know it's a lot of what i liked about first wave was going on in the um, america's best comics at the time they were just they felt different you know they had a different presentation to them a different you know premise a different story and it was something that i really dug and i'm glad we had a chance to talk about league is there anything else about league that you want to mention jim because it's you know i know it's a little bit fresher for you as being something new because you came from the movie to this. Is there anything that we left out? Yeah, actually, uh, not really, you know, cause we did. And it was something that the only, you know, cause I, you know, when we first started talking, I said how much I enjoyed the movie and I enjoyed this and it was just a great experience. And you hit on the nerve just, you know, earlier where you're saying that you wish some of the Mina scenes and the Mina and Quartermain scenes could have been, in the movie, yeah. and it was that that strong female character. I think would have been awesome in that movie because you know that is something that really the comic book had so different than the movie. And you know, having read the comic, I like that part of the story better than what I had with Quartermain and Tom Sawyer in the movie. You have that you know mentor you know student relationship going on going through the movie there, whereas here you had the you know Mina and the Quartermain romance and or respect and or who knows whatever you can call their relationship it's it, each of the two relationships were supposed to take the place of the other and i gotta say that i like the original better than the movie and it's not taking away from the movie i still enjoy the movie and i still would watch the movie again because there was some cool stuff in there but i really gotta say that you know for me now that everything is said and done I'm more of a uh, comic book fan over the movie fan. You know, it's funny, though, uh, and coming in from a different standpoint, I watched the movie in bits and pieces previously. For this, po- for this podcast, these two episodes, was the first time that I watched the movie from start to finish. And a lot of that was due to the, just the negativity that the film was getting. I got to say, the film was a very enjoyable movie. Yeah. Like, yeah, they took liberties and they told the story differently. And yeah, I would have preferred that Mina was the main character, too. Because I would have loved to have seen Sean Connery's Alan Quartermain kind of going through the process of rebuilding himself through his relationship with her. You know, we get to see him become that stronger character at the end. But that being said, I thought he was a great Alan Quartermain. Uh, you know, I thought that film was great and the reveals that were in there. So it was, it was really a, a much better film than I remembered from the bits and pieces that I saw. And I think it was because I walked in with very low expectations this time around. I'm, I expected to walk in saying to myself, oh boy, didn't like this at all. So much prefer that. And I think when you walk into something like that, you know, the only place to go is up. And it, actually, I've got to say, I, I really enjoyed watching the movie again. Uh, it's totally different from the graphic, not totally different from the graphic novel, but it, there's a lot of things that um, it does. It adds new characters in, leaves some characters out. But I thought uh, the Dorian Gray edition, I yeah. thought was terrific. I, you know, that was I really found that very interesting. Um, so that was a good route to go if you're going to make some changes because uh, you got Mina with Dorian and, and had that whole relationship in there, which I thought worked real well. So I don't know. This this was a great experience. I'm glad we had the opportunity to do this on the show, and I hope for people listening that uh, you, you had a, a chance to really enjoy this experience with us. It's a great series, and I highly recommend Volume Two because um, that is where I'm going next. That's going to be the next yeah. thing I read. We are crystal men from Mercury. We have no quarrel with you. Sponsoring us this episode is DCBService.com and InStockTrades.com. If you haven't been checking out DCB Service's 50% off deal, this is your last chance. Make sure to jump in there and get the 50% off of the new 52 books. If you bundle all of the issues, it's 50% off. This is great for those of you that have been waiting to make a decision on your 52 titles. You want to get the first three issues complete of all the series. Great chance to get them at 50% off. Great savings from show sponsor, DCBService.com. Don't forget to check them out as your comiXology 
connection. If you go right to their site, they get the credit for um, any of your purchases. And, you know, it's a great way to help out a sponsor of our show. It doesn't cost you any more to go through D DCB Service to do this. So please make sure to uh, shop for your digital comics at DCBService.com as well. Over at InStockTrades.com, remember, they're your comic book trade and hardcover source. With the new 52 being here, there's lots of wonderful collections of great classic DC stories that have been released in hardcover and trade. And InStockTrades.com is your collected edition source. Uh, they also have a portal of Comixology, so it's another way to collect your digital comics right from uh, InStockTrades.com as well. So you have a couple different options from uh, show sponsors, DCBService.com and InStockTrades.com. And I want to thank them both for supporting our show. Our next episode begins a series of episodes uh, covering the New 52. Jim and I had, uh, it was, we were just planning on covering Men of War, but then we had eight voicemails that came in that led to some really heavy discussion about the New 52. So we actually have a three-hour show coming your way with the New 52. I'm also joined um, in a, a half-an-hour segment by um, Daryl and Chris from the Comic Book Roadshow as uh, they're going to talk about some upcoming interviews that they have. They also give their thoughts on the New 52. So the whole segment um, on the show, the whole show, I should say, is about three hours on the New 52. That's going to be kicking off a series of episodes uh, nonstop, uninterrupted, uh, exclusively about the New 52. We are going to go through and cover every single title. Um, we're going to be finishing up the first issues for some of the titles and go, jumping onto the second issues for other titles that we have not covered yet. We're going to make sure to cover every single book um, that DC's been releasing in this new launch so that way you guys can get our impressions on every title. So we're going to continue that initiative. It's, I'm figuring it's going to take about another month or so to cover everything, but uh, we won't be having any other episodes in between uh, except for New 52 until then. So I want to thank everyone for their patience. Hope you really enjoyed our look at League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, and we will see you next week. Bye. <laughs> Flying through space and time A thousand different lifetimes Fated for love and loss And incredibly clear sidelines Swinging your mace around Such a practical loud look Helping the JSA And occasionally supporting your own book Hawk man, hawk man Eagle eyes can't see Hawk man, your plan what you do to me, Hawk Man? The villains are closing in, be they then in guard or Egyptian. Working so hard to thwart you and Hawker's mission. The odds are not on your side, and danger seems to stack up. Things would be so much easier if you would just cough.